of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And today, I feel blessed to be standing before you with the Word of God. Um, and we will be focusing on the basic principles of Christian life, Christian faith, foundations of Christian faith. What, what do we mean by foundations of Christian faith? When we are looking at the foundations of faith, there are two ways in which to look at the foundations of Christian faith. One is to look at it a systematic way and to examine um, the Bible, the doctrine of the word of God, and then the doctrine of God. And like that, there's a systematic study of theology that's um, happening in Bible colleges and other places. But that's not my way of looking at um, the, doctrines of the, the doctrines of faith or foundations of faith. What's, at, what's at, of utmost importance, like, and the greatest importance, significance, is to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. What are the foundations of Christian faith? When we come to that topic, my wish is to examine the gospel foundations and that one unique message that runs through the Bible the redemption of mankind by the gracious work of Jesus Christ on the cross. So where do we start? First, we come to examine, we are coming to examine the necessity of salvation. Why was salvation necessary? Why was such an act of salvation? The Lord coming down to the earth and dying on the cross. That much of an effort, why was it necessary? And why couldn't God just pick some people from earth and take them to heaven? Or advise some people to be good, give a better law, and then make these people obey the law, and then take them to heaven. So these were not possible. The Lord had to come down. The Lord had to die here. The Lord who created everything, he had to do a rescue act, suffering so much pain and agony and death. And why was that much of pain and effort necessary to save a human being? What was the necessity of such a salvific act, such an initiative from God? This is what we need to understand. And uh, this study primarily focuses on Christian living. That's how we are going to examine the foundations of faith. It, it's with that perspective, we are going to examine the foundations of Christian faith. And now coming to uh, the necessity of salvation. Why salvation was necessary? Our uh, premise is that the whole world was under the yoke of sin. Everyone whom you would find on the street is a sinner. And everyone who is born of this earth are sinners. So you find a person on the road, he's a sinner. Everywhere, everywhere in the world. And how did that slavery to sin occur? How did we become slaves? Okay, so the answer comes from the book of Genesis. We are going to see some basic foundations, like what is life, some basic questions like what is life, and what is sin, and how sin originated. All these questions we are going to see briefly today. Now we look at the book of Genesis to understand how man was created and how man fall, fell into sin. So when we are looking at the creative creation narrative, we understand in verse 27 of chapter 1, uh, chapter 1. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created him. That's chapter 1, verse 27. I'm following the English Standard Version. So that's a brief narrative about creation. And God blessed them. Okay. And 
when god created man we understand that he became a living soul and when god breathed into his nostrils he became a living soul man became a living soul okay and what do you mean by a living soul soul with life he has an existence he has a soul so when body and soul is there there is an existence and soul with life what do we mean by that soul with a life and is there some something like soul plus body without life so we understand that as soul separation from the body soul getting separated from the body the the spiritual part that you know that that part getting separated from the physical part or immaterial part uh, getting separated from the material part that's what we understand by the time death when death happens or soul separated separates from the body so if soul is there then why do we have to say a living soul see now uh, there is why we understand the role of the holy spirit and the spirit of man when god breathed into the nostrils of a um, of something built by the soil of the earth and then god breathed into the nostrils he became a living soul and here we understand man is created by cosmos that means three different aspects to human to human to a human being one is that he has a spirit and then we say he has a soul and then we see he has a body three different parts i don't know whether we can call it parts so man is you know we we, we shall not see a man as a compartmentalized being man was a whole being constituting spirit soul and body but um looking at it again why god why did god create man like that spirit soul and then body and i was thinking you know when god asked man to build a temple or it how how did how was the temple built temple also had three important parts one was the the courtyard and then you had that holy place and then you had the most holy place holy of holy just like that human being also has one part that's outside of everything as a courtyard and then you have your mind attached to the courtyard and then you have the spirit which communicates with god it which understands godly things so i was thinking god created a human being like a living temple with his life in it like the model of the temple and god wanted him to glorify the creator and to worship him and why did god create man after all we are not very certain as to all of god's motives and all of god's plans still we don't understand but one thing is god had to be glorified in all his creation now when god created man and placed them in the garden of eden cutting short the creation event creation narrative god asked them specifically not to eat from a tree that was in the middle of the garden and that was called the tree with fruits that would dis- help them distinguish between good and evil a fruit that would make them more knowledgeable more wise a fruit that would help them understand what was good and what was bad knowledge of good and evil that's a, that's a capacity to distinguish between what's good and what's bad see this is something that we need to look deeper into there was a tree in the middle of the garden which had fruits that would enlighten them about good and bad good and evil so we understand we all need to know 
what's really good and what's evil to lead a righteous life every time we depend on that knowledge of good and evil what is good and what is evil we always do examine that you make a choice in your life you examine whether something is good or something is evil so we always make that distinction before opting for something or doing away with something but god somehow for some reason asked them not to get that knowledge of distinguishing good and evil god did not want adam and eve to distinguish between good and evil and that's a bit difficult to understand why did god decide why did god decide not to let them know what was good and what was evil some people believe god prohibited eating from that fruit uh, eating from that tree or the fruit of that tree because god didn't want man to know evil see that that fruit was not something that would make them evil the fruit would give them knowledge of good and bad so i think it is necessary for every human being like when he is growing up a child when he is growing up we expect him to pick up this knowledge you know to distinguish good and evil unless he does that he needs a parental care he needs the care of an elder who understands good and evil and we wish our children gets this distinction as distinguishing capacity as early as possible in their life and if they don't get it even after 30 years of existence here he doesn't understand what is good and what is evil so it's very difficult for him to survive on this earth but why did god ask man not to get that knowledge not to eat from that tree and get that knowledge what was wrong with that knowledge see this is one critical question that we need to answer there and we understand it from our interpretation of the the construction of man how man was made before eating from that tree man did not have the knowledge of distinguishing good and evil there was only one knowledge that he had and that was the knowledge of his creator he only knew god and no one else everything adam would do he had to ask god what to do how to do because he, he there was no processing of information there is no processing why and when there is no processing of information he can obey the will of god more perfectly to give you an example suppose the lord asks me now stop preaching and go to kashmir a very difficult place that's your next place of ministry i don't process any knowledge i don't think whether it is good or bad to go to kashmir i don't even think if it's proper to finish the sermon in the middle and go suddenly i don't think any of this i don't have that processing system i hear from the lord i proceed because there is no processing in the middle and that's perfect obedience but now what happened i consider a lot of things how to stop in the middle is it possible no that's improper because i have an understanding of what's proper and what's not proper and then i would start thinking in kashmir where will i stay will my get will my children get proper education will they have schools or how will be the health healthcare there i remember in 2004 um when i went to andhra pradesh as a missionary the first thing i searched there was whether my mobile would get get range there because there are considerations you know even if there was there there were no range i would go but still that was a concern see we ask questions about propriety convenience and all those before taking a decision our, our mind weighs this and weighs that and then arrives at a decision so by the time our obedience will be partial now man did not have that processing he enjoyed god's fellowship he understood what god was speaking to him but one problem you know i we, i cannot call that a problem um, maybe they will instilled into them 
this thought that it was a problem that they had to depend on god for everything adam had to depend on god for everything because he did not have his own process his own system and that dependence on the father on god for every individual decisions and that was something like a slavery for a human being because he could not be on his own we know our god is independent and he, and he does not depend on anyone but man is not like made like that man is made to depend on god and god breathed into his nostrils gave him his spirit life from his spirit and man became a living soul and that life he has to live independence of independent you know, depending on god but now devil is tempting him um be like god himself and god knows what's good and bad he has his own processing system he can live an independent life but you cannot because you don't know what is good and evil and you always need to depend on god so devil is tempting them to adjust to a new system of living where you don't need god anymore to direct you you can be your own director and king and decide what's good for you and what to do and what not to do by your own processing system that means you are no longer dependent on dependent on the concepts of as to what god would think and as to what god would like so the devil was tempting him for an independence from god separation from god so that he could be on his own and he can take his own short small decisions and now we have this system of good and evil now many of you who are listening to me at the end of the sermon would be asking this question was the sermon good or bad that is that's how our mind processes it and you look at a shirt and think was the was it good was the shirt good or bad a human being or a church or a pastor or a message or a book or anything that you come across or a, or a means of transport whatever you evaluate on the basis of good and bad hotel you eat, the food that you eat and we are living by that evaluation what's the alternative is there an alternative if you are not living by that parameter or that paradigm is there an alternative the alternative is completely depend on god let god dictate and that will be you know tougher because for every single thing we need god's leading and when we get children of our own when we become parents we look at our children and we want them to be independent we don't want them to be dependent on us forever when we make them grow up we give them education so that they become independent and move out and suppose some a, a child is you know now 30 years of age a young man and he is still dependent on his parents we don't appreciate that we want them to be independent we want them to be earning and we want them to support their parents but god's idea of growth is not like that human idea of growth is that a child he grows up and becomes independent of his parents but god's idea of growth is not like that when we become more and more dependent on god and we come to a stage where we cannot do anything without god now i am standing before you preaching and if i cannot do anything without god not if utter one sentence if god is not with me i become incapable incapacitated that means i am growing i am growing into maturity if i cannot do anything without the help of god i become weak and i depend solely on the strength of god and that's god's idea of growth suppose i wake up in the morning i cannot do anything without god i stand up and say oh lord without you i cannot do anything my wisdom is nothing you have to lead me by your hand because i am an ignorant person your wisdom shall sustain me if i feel like that continuously 
that is my growth and if i don't feel like that i feel capable of doing it being independent of god that means i am not growing most of the time we pray in the morning but don't depend on him on a daily minute by minute basis okay now based on these as these conceptions we are trying to define what is life and what is death and what we lack what is life see what is life and biologically it's very difficult to answer what is life we give a definition for life and i don't think any biologist have defined life maybe we can define living but it's difficult to define what is life we can say different um you know characteristics of life that is possible but what is that thing called life it's very difficult to define but there is one definition given in the bible for life and that comes from john chapter 17 verse 3 and this is eternal life that they know you the only true god and jesus christ whom you have sent to know god and that's a really important phrase what is life eternal life a life that never ends a life that is qualitatively different a life that is um divine god given god breathed okay so <clears throat> what's the definition for that life that life is knowing god and jesus christ knowing the father and the son and then what is death so if you ask what is death we come back to genesis and read this commandment that god gave them verse 17 of chapter 2 says but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die so what does you and what do you understand by the term death and life what is life and what is death life is that you know god you know god means what now i am preaching to you i know god means i know what god wants me to preach as a father if i say i know god i mean to say i know what god wants me to do as a father or as a son or as a husband i know how jesus would have done that knowing christ and through christ knowing father knowledge of christ and now what is death death is not knowing god having our own system of existence in simpler terms we can say either you can live by the spirit depending on god or you can live soulish lives depending on your thinking understanding intelligence memories that's one option living by the soul soulish living so most of christians now are soulish they do a lot of things but most of them come by from their evaluation of what is good and what is evil what is proper and what is improper but when you have life you will have the life of sun life of the sun flowing through you and you know what jesus would have done and then our evaluation changes our perspective about life changes when i ask myself how jesus would have preached and what he would have spoken how he would have loved one loved another person how he would have given himself up in today's context in my context when i know it i have the life of christ so what happened at the garden of eden they lost the life of god that god breathed the life and they still were existing they still were walking they still were talking and they were doing all the daily things that they needed to do 
and they could see one another, talk with one another. But one thing was lacking, that God breathed life was gone. They were dead. And they didn't have the spirit of God communicating to them godly things. They lost that connection. They were good people still. They were not bad people. They were not trying to attack one another. They loved one another. They were protecting one another. They were hiding the nakedness of one another. They were good to one another. And they were collaborating together to sew together fig leaves to hide their nakedness. And they were good people. They were good people, but still lacking life. There are so many good people around us in the church and outside who does everything fine, well, but they don't have life inside. And the life that God breathed, life that can be given to you only by the Spirit of God. Spirit-given life. And without that life, we are all dead. And what happened when they ate from the tree of good and evil? Now let's um, see what happened. When the devil tempted them to eat from that, from that particular tree, he ate from it and gave it to Adam and Adam also ate. Now they understood one thing. They were naked. Their eyes were opened. Which eyes? No, I was telling you about a system of processing. Those eyes opened. And now they could understand what was good and what was bad. But God's life was gone and his glory was gone. And they felt they were naked. Verse 7 of chapter 3. Then the eyes of both were opened. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves blowing cloths. And immediately they covered their nakedness. And at the next moment they hear the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden, the cool of the day. And in, if you read the Bi English Bible, there's a word and connecting with that previous verse. That means they covered themselves, covered their nakedness and using loin clothes made of fig leaves. And the very next moment it said, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And what was the response? They were supposed to be fine because they were not naked anymore. They had the loin cloths, they painstakingly stitched together using fig leaves. And they felt good, they had this eyes opened. But something very strange happened there. But the Lord God the man and his wife, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid. Because I was naked, I hid myself. Were they really naked? They were not. They were naked. They felt naked when they ate the fruit. But after covering them with the loin cloths, why did they feel naked before God? See, suppose we are naked for some time privately, maybe in the bathroom. God is there, right? God's presence is there. God always knows us. He created us. Then why do we need to be ashamed before God of our nakedness? We need to be ashamed before men. How many of you are ashamed before God of physical nakedness? I don't think that's possible. Then what was that bothering Adam? Why did he say we were naked? See, they had lost something. They had tried to cover it up. But that was, no, that was of no avail before God. Before men it worked. Before Eve it worked. But before God, it did not work. Most of our works of righteousness, most of the religious things that we do, 
the long prayers for worship systems, a participation in church programs, our acts of righteousness, giving away of money, all these things act like fig leaves covering our real depravity. And people see us, they think, oh, Chase, Chase brother is, or pastor is very, really nice man. How did they come to that judgment? Looking at my fig leaves. Oh, he talks very nicely. Maybe my heart is different. Maybe I'm angry with that person, but still speaking nice things because I am a civilized being. I don't want to hurt him by opening up my heart. So that could be the reason why I was, um, I was behaving in a civil way. Now, in Kerala especially, we are a little more hypocritic. I don't know about other people. When you visit some places, they would say, please have lunch and go. Maybe they don't have anything there. But still they pretend that they are ready to give you lunch. And they, you are supposed to say, no, no, not this time. We are going. We will see another time. Sometimes our relatives would say, stay one more day. They don't mean it. See, if you don't have any of these fig leaves that you show others, suppose all these fig leaves are taken away. Suddenly your heart is exposed, something that you are hiding from everyone else. And we keep a strong guard on our, on our heart. Suppose everything that thinks that you think about your neighbor, he comes to understand. He, he would not be able to tolerate you. Suppose someone can read all your thoughts. Your wife or your husband can read all your thoughts. I don't think it's possible for you both to stay together. For that matter, anyone in the world. I don't think two people can coexist if they know each other too deeply. Because there's a filthy inside for every, every man. And we cover the outer man with every good work. We give away gifts to poor people. They help. You help in giving, you know, help them in construct, for constructing their houses, make, building their houses, or give them money for daily sustenance. All these things we do, and we appear good before people, but in our heart, the filth remains. And we cannot just wipe that off. Years back when we were in our Andhra Pradesh, a lady came to our home. And he had, she had a quarrel with us. And quarrel in the sense that he, she wanted to take one of her children away. And we had three adopt, we have three adopted children, and one girl she wanted to take away by giving us some false, um, you know, false claims that she was her grand grandmother like that. That was a false claim and she was trying to kidnap that girl. And my wife objected. The child started crying. And this lady slapped my wife three times against her cheek. I was watching the whole process, standing some 50 feet away. And my wife, fortunately, by God's grace, did not beat her back did not retire, did not say anything, did not respond, just stood there and received those slaps. I was really very happy. I was rejoicing. I went around my home and went around my house and praised the Lord, thanking him, oh Lord, thank you for helping my wife to show the other cheek when she was slapped on one. Thank you, Lord, for letting her stay calm and not allowing her to retaliate or shout. Thank you, Lord, for giving her that patience. I was thanking God for so many things. And I could understand in my spirit that God did not take that thankfulness seriously. And he was not pleased with that. I knew it. I felt that. 
God telling me, I am not satisfied. I am not happy with the way you are thanking me or with the way your wife tolerated that. Then I was asking my heart, why was it not acceptable to God? Then God's spirit told me, and revealed it to me. Maybe she received those slaps, but our hearts were filled with anger towards that lady. We didn't do anything. But still our heart was full of anger because that slap was unjustified. And she was the aggressive person coming into our home, home in the night and slapping my wife. So we had that righteous anger trying to kidnap a girl a righteous anger building in a building up in us. So we could not love her, love that person who was assaulting us. And the Lord was looking into our hearts and he found filth there, hate, anger there. And, and we were trying to, you know, show some fig leaves to the fig leaves to the Lord and say, Lord, look at our actions. And the Lord was not pleased. I understood one thing: it's very difficult to please God like that. And it is almost impossible to please God. Not almost. Man cannot please God by his works because he has no life in, life in him. And this is what is explained in the book of John. Before we come to John, we will finish this discourse from the book of Genesis. And then we will move to the book of John to understand what is life. Now, another consequence of losing divine life. We can see that uh, in that conversation between God and man. When God asked him this question, um, verse 9 of chapter 3. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, Man should have said, Yes, Lord, I'm sorry. But he never expresses regret. He never asks for forgiveness. Because in his evaluation, he did not do anything wrong. And that shows spiritual death. And that's one mark of spiritual death. You evaluate something and you don't find to be culpable. And you justify yourself. You think you are right and the other person is wrong. You, it's, it's a mark of spiritual death. And Adam here says, The woman whom you gave, gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Shift at the blame. He was responsible, but he's now shifting the blame and he tells the woman did it. And the woman, when God asked the woman, then the Lord said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate. Now, she also shifted the blame. This happens all the time in our life. Somehow, our mechanism is that we always shift the blame. We don't want to be held accountable. Because we are sitting at the throne of judgment. We are the new kings. In our efforts to become like the Lord who controlled everything, king enthroned over everything, we became small kings, establishing small kingdoms around us. So, a husband and wife staying together, Husband has a small kingdom where he decides everything. Wife has a small kingdom where she decides everything. And these kingdoms sometimes enter into fight to, you know, to get to know which kingdom is stronger. We, we have all become small kings. We have established our country, our, our nations, our you know, you know, kingdoms, not nations, kingdoms. Established our throne and we judge and we decide that brother 
did wrong, I did not. And always this court has one system. This court exists with one ambition to justify myself and, give, and send me scot free. And my court of justice always works over time to declare me not guilty. Suppose I quarrel with one of you today. Okay, I'm not going to do that. No, hopefully, but just imagine. And after some time, I feel guilty. Oh, I, will, I, will say, I will say to myself, oh, my Lord, I did wrong. I should not have retorted like that. I should have been more patient. Then I want to call that man and say, Apologize. I'm sorry, brother. I, I was overcharged. You know, I was emotionally overcharged. That's why I responded like that. I'm sorry. I wanted to say that, but I could not make myself do it. I'm just going home, sleeping. By the time I wake up in the morning, I don't feel like calling him again because my court, that system of justice, the system of right and wrong, good and evil, had a, had a selfish evaluation of the whole thing and found this one thing out. You know what was that? That man is also equally culpable. You responded to him only because he was angry with you. And that's natural. Why should you apologize to him? He also should apologize to you. So that's how our court will justify ourselves. Okay. And our court, that means I am the king of that court or, or the judge of that court, never will hold myself guilty and accountable beyond a point. And final blame will be given to someone. And this is what happens. And when God looks at these things, everything is different. Okay. Now Eve blames Satan and Adam blamed God. Adam did not blame Eve. Adam indirectly blamed God because Adam was not given a good wife, a godly wife. Adam was given a very weak wife who fell before the machinations of the devil. And some of our, we Adams feel that we did not get the correct Eve. If God had given us a better Eve, I would not have seen. Adam would have said like that, thought like that. But see, I believe both were the same. Because when Eve brought that fruit to Adam and asked him to eat, Adam could have said very easily, what? Um, no, 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 don't eat this Eve. God has prohibited us from eating from that tree. Adam did not do that. Adam also received it. Give me and he also ate. So both were of same character. And Eve was taken out of Adam's body. So they were both same. Okay. Now, uh, now, this is one consequence of sin, soulish living, soul becoming supreme, soul becoming the arbitrator, I becoming the arbitrator of justice for my sake, to establish to my uh, to establish my innocence. To vindicate me, to vindicate myself. If my court is working overboard, this is what was happening to Pharisees and scribes and every one of them. They were self-righteous and they were thinking about their system of understanding and their evaluation of things and how they how things work. So most of the time we are also like that. And that's because we are all Adamic children, Adam's children. We are we are all born with that self-righteous. Self righteousness. We were, all, we were all born with that sinfulness. We were all slaves of sin. And then the Lord tells us, I, I will close with one verse from the book of John, chapter 1, verse 4. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The life was the light of men. See, imagine John introducing Jesus Christ after almost 65 years. 
John is introducing Jesus Christ like this. In him was life. Suppose I introduce someone like that. Yesterday I was traveling uh, in a bus. There was a man sitting near me. You know, he had life. What would you think? What would you say? Is that a news? No. Everyone has life. We think like that. Suppose I say, a man was sitting near me. He did not have life. Then it is news. Imagine John introducing Jesus Christ like this. There was a man who lived with us many, many years back. He had life. That's a strange way of introducing someone. And these disciples would have wondered, John, why are you saying like that? We all have, we all are living. Why do you say that one particular man had life? And that's where we understand the difference between the life that Jesus gives us and the life that we think we have. And John explains, I said he has life because his life is like light. And it shines in the darkness and the darkness could not overcome it. Now, life like light. This is what Adam and Eve lost. Life like light. What's the significance of that comparison? How is life like light? When we were younger, we would get watches as gifts. Sometimes we would um, see watches of someone else in our home and guests come. We look at their watch and we want to examine whether it radiates light. So we take that inside, that watch inside a dark room and examine whether it's emanating light, whether it's emitting light. Just like that. To test whether something has light, the best way to test it is to keep it in darkness. And only darkness can test whether something is really glowing or is only reflecting. If something was only reflecting light, you keep it in darkness, there will not be any light. But if it's not reflecting light, it's, it is a genuine source of light. You keep it in darkness, it will glow much further, much more brightly. Now, life is, it, if it is true life, glows brightly when it is kept in darkness. The life of Jesus was like that. It shone brightly on the cross when everything was dark and, and he was all alone, abandoned by everyone. In deep pain of death, he was so full of life. And our life is not like that. Our life are reflective lives. Like, you know, if someone smiles at me, I smile at him back. If someone is angry at me, I am angry with him as well. When if someone hates me, I hate him as well. When something is dark around me, I lose my brightness. I become gloomy. I stop showing light. That means I didn't have real light. So I didn't have real life because I am not shining in darkness. When I feel my husband was not good, good enough to me, when I feel my wife was not good enough to me, I don't feel that love. I feel anger. Why? Because when the surroundings stand darker, your soul also experienced that darkness. You didn't have light of your own. Jesus was not like that. Jesus' life shone more brightly when there was darkness around. Then there was a sinner whom God hates. No, by concept. Concept. A sinner has to go to hell, right? Just he to face God's anger, not hatred, anger. And when Jesus meets them, darkness, absolute darkness, and he is like, people hate him, people follow him, people love him. There are different reactions, but Jesus does not hate. He's always love. Love that never changes. Love that cannot be terminated, extinguished even by death. And that is life. You have life only if life is like light. That is, that's the quality of divine life. We never change. If someone is cheating you, no problem. You are a loving person. 
if someone is gossiping against you you hear about that you are not feeling angry because that darkness cannot affect your brightness your light this light shines much further much more brightly in when there is darkness around so this is what this is how john defines the life of jesus it was like light that shines in darkness and we always shall ask this question to ourselves do we have light that shines in darkness do we really have that light when john, when jesus was going to jerusalem he found a fig leaf fig tree and he was very hungry he looked for fruits and he didn't have anything there on Crushed the tree, and there was written underneath. There is written underneath. It was not the season for fig, that not the season for fruits. And I was amazed. Why did Jesus curse that tree, knowing very well that it was not a season for um, fruits? Why was that? Now, later on, I understood. God is always like that. He never asks me fruit now, when I am comfortable, when I am preaching. If I, if He asks me, Chase, where is your fruit? i will tell lord look at me i am preaching your word suppose after some time i meet a person who hates me gossips against me and i stand before him my face is not face is darkened i don't feel that love i am feeling that hatred inside me but god would ask me chase where is your fruit of love i say lord it's not the season let him go i will show you how good i am the lord would say i don't want that type of fruit that season true life produces fruits in all seasons all seasons and that fruit will taste sweet sweeter much more sweeter when there is unseason when it is not season and that's what true life represents and that's what that's the life that the lord wants to give us stable steadfast um something that cannot be switched off something that cannot be stopped until we die until we are gone from this earth and this life is the divine gift that jesus gives us we grow in that life into a perfection slowly over our course of life and god would ultimately give us that perfection and this was you know, uh, something like an introduction and about life that we need to live life that divine life that's bestowed on us and let us 